All right, well, thank you to the course directors for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, as far as lateral deformity correction is concerned, uh, we're going to go through the approach rationale. We're going to review some anatomical uh, points. Uh, we're going to look at access considerations and preoperative planning. Uh, we're going to look at specific different deformities and what one should think about in, in terms of approaching a deformity from the lateral approach. And we're going to look at some patient examples. So uh, the, the sequence of, uh, of lateral approaches to deformity is going to start out with uh, uh, having a monitoring system in place. You know, any lateral trans-SOAS uh, deformity, this is the one time where neuromonitoring uh, becomes uh, quite important. Uh, and, uh, you know, neuromonitoring is, is uh, controversial in terms of its necessity in a lot of cases, and there are a lot of advocates uh, that suggest no monitoring for nothing. Uh, but uh, this is the one exception in spine surgery where monitoring uh, is absolutely necessary uh, because of the obvious uh, presence of the lumbosacral plexus. So that's one, one thing that that we got to be careful about if we say neuromonitoring is not necessary. This, this is uh, actually very necessary for, for this approach. So what are the advantages of, uh, of the lateral approach? Um, so it's, it's a potentially a, a muscle sparing uh, uh, technique. Uh, it's minimally invasive. Uh, you have the opportunity to restore the anterior column. Uh, and uh, you can, to some degree, uh, restore sagittal balance. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, all of the talks that we've had so far when we discuss uh, the main workhorse for sagittal balance improvement. Uh, the, the lateral technique is not the main workhorse for this, uh, but, but, uh, but it, it does influence it to some degree. So, uh, so the, the rationale for the direct lateral approach is really based on our exposure for routine anterior approaches. And, you know, when we talk about the lateral approach, it really is an anterior approach, but it's just an anterolateral uh, approach. And so a lot of the uh, concept of how uh, this technique originated really uh, is based on our own uh, knowledge and exposure to our standard anterior approaches. And so, uh, so it can be performed with supplemental fixation uh, or lateral plating or posterior instrumentation. Uh, very rarely does one advocate for standalone usage of uh, uh, the lateral inner body uh, cages, but uh, as time passes, uh, I think we may encounter certain scenarios where that may be uh, a viable option because it does significantly increase the rigidity of, of that inner space uh, substantially and the uh, additional fixation may or may not be uh, that much of an additive uh, benefit uh, when it's a one level uh, surgery. And uh, one of the other benefits is minimal blood loss and operative time. The lack of an approach surgeon certainly can be uh, uh, useful. Uh, so, uh, so as far as what levels, uh, the direct lateral uh, approach is going to be L1 to L5 uh, when dealing with a lumbar spine. You know, you can actually go up higher uh, in the thoracic spine as well. So, uh, so one of the other benefits when comparing it to anterior surgery is uh, avoiding retraction of the great vessels. Uh, and uh, you have the opportunity for anterior load bearing. Uh, for better fusion. And uh, you have a much larger surface area for bone healing when you compare this to uh, T-lifts or PLIFs. So uh, definitely a, uh, a big advantage. Uh, so uh, you're going to have an, the opportunity for a greater opportunity for an indirect decompression uh, when you compare that to a T-lift or a PLIF uh, technique. Uh, a greater opportunity to remove a greater amount of the disc and hence get a better uh, amount of surface area for fusion. And uh, in a, when doing a PLIF or a T-lift, if you have a very tall disc base, uh, that becomes less of a stable uh, entity uh, when you're using a PLIF or a T-lift and, and uh, having that lateral cage 
uh, is, uh, is a lot stronger uh, when you're dealing with uh, a, a tall disk space. And uh, you don't have to retract uh, the neural structures with the exception of the fact that you're, you're retracting the lumbosacral plexus, but, but uh, you're, you know, you're not directly retracting the, uh, the dura. And, uh, and so there's, as such, there's less of a chance for a CSF leak. So, uh, so, so what are the optimal conditions for a, uh, a direct lateral? Uh, is, this is optimally uh, designed for L1 to L5. Uh, sometimes L4-5 can be challenging if there's a high riding iliac crest. Uh, if you've had a patient with multiple previous uh, uh, posterior surgeries where there's a lot of scar tissue, uh, this provides you with a fresh plane uh, to gain access to the disk space. That's one of the other potential advantages. Uh, an ideal circumstance would be uh, someone who's had a L L5 S1 fusion who needs an adjacent segment uh, procedure or L4 to S1 fusion with an adjacent segment procedure at L34. Uh, pseudarthroses uh, after a posterior fusion without inner body, uh, this can be uh, uh, successfully uh, addressed by uh, approaching the disk space from the lateral approach. Again, you get a fresh, uh, clean tissue plane. Uh, for patients with degenerative scoliosis, uh, if the scoliosis is not severely imbalanced as far as the uh, uh, sagittal vertebral axis, uh, sagittal, sagittal vertical axis, uh, you, can, you can get uh, a very reasonable correction of, of scoliosis from the lateral uh, approach uh, when regarding coronal alignment. And also for grade one or grade two spondylolisthesis, you can get, uh, with a distraction from the inner body, uh, you can get a, a significant correction of this. And, and so uh, uh, we'll show some case examples of all of these uh, situations. So as far as the anatomy is concerned, uh, we're going to start out with uh, looking at what layers you go through when you're doing the direct uh, lateral uh, retroperitoneal approach. Uh, so as far as which muscle layers are you're going to go through, uh, the external oblique followed by the internal oblique. Uh, then you're going to go through the transversus abdominis muscle and, and then the transversalis fascia. Uh, then at that point, you're going to be able to uh, palpate the psoas muscle, and you also want to palpate the transverse process. Uh, so, uh, so you're going to be in the retroperitoneal fat uh, at this point. And so the uh, neurologic structures uh, you have to be familiar with, uh, as these are the very structures that we're trying to, to, uh, to be knowledgeable, out, knowledgeable about. And uh, like uh, Dan uh, explained earlier, uh, you can't really predict a sensory deficit from these approaches. So uh, we're retracting nerve roots. Uh, a, lar a large amount of these nerve roots are sensory. Uh, at, when you're doing a trans-psoas approach, you're, you're essentially splitting the muscle fibers of the psoas muscle. And along with those muscle fibers, you may be retracting against uh, sensory nerve fibers. And uh, the only way to really uh, know whether or not any damage is done is to have the patient wake up and, and see. You know, fortunately, very often these are temporary sensory uh, losses, and, and very often they're transient, uh, but sometimes they're not. Um, so, so the uh, the uh, the genitofemoral nerve uh, in, involves the uh, uh, the cremaster uh, uh, reflex and and. and uh, can also be associated with scrotal pain if it's damaged. Uh, the hypogastric sympathetic plexus uh, can result in retrograde ejaculation. And uh, you can also have uh, hyperthermia uh, reactions uh, due to uh, sympathetic chain uh, 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 damage. So this is a uh, further schematic. Uh, indicating the, uh, the uh, nerves that are in the vicinity of the psoas muscle and uh, the potential for, for, uh, for injury. Um, when this uh, technique was uh, introduced, uh, the incidence of weakness and femoral palsies uh, was a lot higher. Uh, and I think as, 
as time passes and people have learned more and more about the lumbosacral plexus and have uh, appreciated more of the anatomy of the lumbosacral plexus uh, the, uh, the, and the need for monitoring, uh, the, uh, the incidence of these palsies has, has decreased significantly. Uh, at our institution, uh, in order to uh, reduce the incidence of a palsy, uh, we actually put electrodes into all four heads of the quadriceps, uh, and this will catch uh, more of the nuances of retraction uh, than if one were to randomly put an electrode into one head of the quadricep. And, and so that w is one technical way to uh, catch more of these retraction injuries. And so uh, Levy et al. Uh, examined the uh, lumbosacral plexus in, in uh, cadavers and uh, came up with a good schematic to look at, at the uh, positioning of the lumbosacral plexus with respect to the disc space. And you can see as you go further down, at L45, that's where the lumbosacral plexus is going to be uh, at more risk. So uh, looking at 118 patients from uh, their, their group uh, at, in 201 disc spaces that were treated, uh, they reported a 1.7 incidence of ephemeral nerve injury. Uh, and uh, they also reported a 4% abdominal flank bulge. Uh, does anybody know uh, why an abdominal flank bulge may occur, like what, what uh, nerve is, could potentially be injured uh, from an, an, an abdominal flank that would result in an abdominal flank bulge. It's a nerve that comes out right around L1, L2. Uh, so it's the, the uh, so the, the, the iliogast, hypogastric, yeah. So, so that, that nerve, uh, can come out right around this area, and again, it's it's one of those one of those uh, uh, things that you're not going to be able to monitor, and uh, damage to that nerve can result in in uh, an abdominal bulge. So uh, so uh, looking at the uh, the success rate, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, success of being able to access and, and treat the L45 interspace was, uh, that was the least successful. Uh, the other levels were 100% of the, of, of the uh, levels were be able to be treated. And uh, the, you know, the lack of success is always due to the positioning of the lumbosacral plexus within the vicinity of the L45 disc space. So uh, you can see that, that uh, that the abdominal flank bulge, uh, again, is most common uh, at the higher levels uh, being fused. Uh, so L12 and L23 are the more common uh, culprits for, for that problem. So uh, important points about uh, patient positioning. Uh, you're gonna gain access to this retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal space by having the patient appropriately a position such that the iliac crest is uh, separated away from the bottom part of the rib cage. And uh, you need to pa place this patient on a table such that uh, you can break the table and uh, gain uh, that access point. And uh, so that's, that's the other important feature of the positioning is to make sure that uh, this leg is flexed and that way you have less tension uh, within the psoas muscle itself. Uh, the reduced amount of tension within that psoas muscle uh, is going to uh, give you a little bit more latitude with the degree to which you can retract uh, once you're trans psoas. Uh, so if you have a tensed uh, psoas muscle, when you retract, you're going to be putting more pressure on the, on the plexus uh, than if that psoas muscle is more relaxed. So, uh, so as far as uh, patient positioning, uh, you're going to want to put a roll, a roll at the break point in the bed. Uh, you're going to potentially uh, use a bean bag to maintain the positioning. And so, like I mentioned earlier, you want to flex that that uh, that hip. Uh, and uh, and so, so there there are a couple different ways to go about. Uh, accessing the, the retroperitoneal space. You can either choose a two incision approach or a one incision approach. Uh, initially, it's advocated 
to, to start out with this two incision approach where you make a separate incision in more, more posteriorly such that you'll be able to put your finger into that retroperitoneal space uh, and then uh, meet uh, uh, up here where you make a separate incision and you'll be able to safely uh, determine whether or not you are avoiding uh, the entrance to the peritoneal cavity. So uh, by, by doing this way, they, it's a little bit safer uh, than just making uh, an incision uh, out here at the very beginning. Uh, if, you do, if you choose not to do the two incision approach, uh, I would advocate for making this incision just a little bit bigger uh, and that way you'll be able to see the, the, uh, the, the muscle layers a little bit more readily and it'll almost be treating it like a mini open approach uh, uh, when, when thinking about a general lateral, uh, direct lateral approach to the spine as you would experience during a normal open procedure. So, uh, so it's, uh, at this point, uh, this is where you would put in your, your, uh, your, your uh, uh, dilator uh, and uh, your, your uh, neuromonitoring uh, stimulator such that you can check for the lumbosacral plexus and use AP uh, and lateral fluoro to identify the proper position to dock your, your, uh, your uh, dilating tubes. So uh, uh, this is a, as, as is the case with any MIS, uh, procedure, your, your accuracy is only going to be as good as your ability to image. Uh, so it becomes increasingly important for you to have very good fluoroscopic images and they have to, you have to strive for a perfect AP and a perfect lateral. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, done best by rotating the table uh, rather than the C-arm. Uh, you want to have the patient uh, essentially uh, 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 perpendicular to the room, uh, that, that way uh, the uh, fluoro is going to be more easily managed and uh, there's going to be less, less of a fiddle factor to get perfect images. And so uh, moving on to uh, the implants, uh, you know, there are a variety of different options to, to do this and uh, 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 looking at, at uh, ways to uh, improve uh, your, uh, the amount of lordosis that you can achieve. Uh, this is a, uh, a, uh, a review of uh, release of the anterior longitudinal ligament. You know, we, uh, we all have uh, re discussed that the main workhorse for the correction of sagittal uh, deformity is the posterior approach with the osteotomy techniques. Uh, but what we uh, often forget about is that uh, an anterior lengthening uh, can also be potentially an option. And, and uh, this is uh, from Juan Uribe's uh, 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 group uh, in uh, South Florida, uh, where they uh, discuss uh, the release of the, the anterior longitudinal ligament as a means of, of providing increased uh, 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 sagittal correction. Um, you can see, though, that, that again, we're not talking about uh, cases with huge uh, sagittal vertebral axis uh, numbers. You know, these are fairly uh, uh, mild cases of sagittal imbalance. And so, again, even with the release of the ALL, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're aiming at trying to treat patients with relatively minimal sagittal uh, malalignment. And so, uh, so, so while they had a successful uh, result, uh, you know, again, we're, we're starting out with, with deformities that are, are relatively minimal. And uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, for this anterior only uh, example, uh, uh, the, the amount of alignment uh, uh, that is achieved in terms of the correction is primarily coronal. Uh, the, you know, you can certainly get a better alignment uh, 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 with the inner body spacers put in laterally from the coronal perspective. Again, the focus of this article was on the coronal alignment rather than the sagittal. So, uh, 
you know, what if you need uh, more uh, correction? You know, can you use this procedure in conjunction with a posterior procedure? And, and certainly you can. Uh, there are some people who have advocated for the lateral uh, uh, insertion of spacers into the disc spaces above and below the area where you would plan to do your osteotomy. And that way you would have a, a, a stiffer construct. Very often the site of the osteotomy is a potential source for rod failure and rod fracture. And that's due to the presence of disc material above and below the osteotomy and, and a, a potentially loose part of the spine. Uh, so increasing the rigidity of that by putting in these lateral spacers will uh, potentially stiffen up that area where the, the, the spine could be potentially vulnerable. And so uh, I think this is a later uh, study from Juan uh, Uribe uh, looking at further uh, outcomes. And, and uh, uh, he does describe a better uh, ability to correct the sagittal vertebral axis using this anterior release uh, 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 technique. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, uh, certainly uh, is, is uh, I think, a, something to consider uh, as it may gain increased importance in the future. And when combined at multiple levels, uh, I think multiple anterior releases uh, uh, combined with posterior instrumentation uh, could potentially achieve uh, similar correction to uh, osteotomies. Uh, so uh, just, these are just looking at some, some routine fluoro shots during a, a deformity correction. You can see how initially over here you start out with a fairly uh, prominent uh, coronal uh, uh, deformity. And uh, the important thing in, as far as technique is concerned is to get into that, that plane within uh, the end plate and, and to go all the way across and make sure you break across that osteophyte that might be present because without breaking across that osteophyte, you're not going to be able to distract uh, the way you would want to uh, and uh, hence would uh, get less of a correction than, than you would like. So, so make, make sure that you go all the way across. You want to put in uh, uh, cages or trials uh, with maximal uh, uh, height. Uh, and distraction, and as you can see, as, as this is inserted, uh, you get a, a very good correction of that uh, previously abnormal coronal uh, malalignment. And uh, uh, you can see this is uh, another uh, example of uh, a, a very solid uh, 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 coronal realignment. Uh, you get a partial uh, correction just from the uh, anterior portion of the surgery. Uh, and uh, in a staged manner, we go in and put in the posterior screws. Uh, this is a 74-year-old dentist who I treated, uh, and scheduled for an anterior, uh, posterior, uh, and uh, uh, he uh, was recovering from the anterior part, and you can see he has a partial improvement of his, of his uh, uh, coronal uh, deformity. Uh, he really felt so good after this anterior uh, correction that he refused to have the posterior part. Um, so, you know, I, I think he's going to need it. And, you know, this was, this case is only about uh, a month old. So we'll see, we'll see how, how he does, but he's going to come back and see me in clinic in another couple weeks. And, uh, but originally, you know, this was going to be a, a, a larger construct, but, but he's, He's very relieved with, uh, with, with his preoperative symptoms at this point and does not want any, any further surgery. So uh, as far as uh, other deformities, uh, you know, grade one and grade two spondies, a uh, perfect application for this technique, uh, especially if you have a patient with a spondy with a fairly decent sized disc space and uh, not, you know, mild to moderate stenosis within the neural foramen. I think you can get a very uh, nice inner body graft uh, into this into this disc space, and uh, and have uh, a resolution of of uh, of pain and and, uh, and and pathology. 
Um, so how much of a foraminal decompression can you actually get uh, you know, from this indirect uh, decompression? Uh, the answer is that you can get about a 35% area increase. And this is a study that uh, evaluated that specific question. And so you, that foraminal area of 35% uh, is significant because it provides you with, with significant uh, relief of, of symptoms. And uh, this was all correlated with improvement in patient uh, pain scores. So uh, one thing to remember is that your indirect decompression is only as good as the spine's ability to sustain that distractive force. And so uh, if you end up having subsidence uh, of your inner body cage, uh, you're going to lose the effect of your indirect decompression and, and start out you know, where you, where you uh, and, and end up where you started out as far as your foraminal area is concerned. And so uh, this, this is a, a patient who I treated uh, 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 not too long ago who uh, had a, 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 a extensive decompression uh, uh, by another surgeon. And uh, this, this patient uh, developed a iatrogenic spondy. Um, she was an 81-year-old woman and didn't want another big surgery, yet she was having a lot of pain and instability. So she had this uh, indirect uh, uh, lateral fusion and and so initially her alignment was better and she had no subsidence but you can see over time uh, she started to uh, subside further uh, she is fused however so uh, she's doing better but she's not as good as she was uh, on post-op day one so uh, looking at uh, this subsidence issue Pimenta uh, evaluated some of their series uh, retrospectively and came to the conclusion that uh, the larger the cage uh, in terms of its uh, lateral dimensions uh, and AP dimensions, the smaller the incidence of subsidence. And this makes perfect sense because you want to engage the, uh, the outer uh, ring of the end plate uh, to the maximum degree. So uh, when, when doing uh, lateral inner body fusions in order to reduce the risk of subsidence, and to have a, a long-lasting effect of that distractive force, um, uh, you really want to make sure that your cage is as long as possible from both the lateral and AP dimensions. So, uh, so in, in the treatment of lateral deformity, you know, the, there are a wide scope of, of options. Uh, you know, you're, you're really going to uh, often, you know, I think the best uh, results are achieved through a combined approach when you're dealing with a lateral uh, approach. I think the lateral approach mostly, in my opinion, is a adjunct to, to a posterior approach uh, when dealing with uh, deformity. Uh, it's only small deformities that could potentially be treated with a lateral approach on its own. Uh, and, but when, when you use it in conjunction with the posterior approach, I, th I think you can have a very powerful uh, means of, uh, of correcting deformity. Thank you.